The average length of an album's production differs from band to band and genre to genre. There's famous examples of albums made in a few weeks, a few days, and even a few hours. But these have always been the outliers, and Weezer has never been one of those bands. Except once. Nobody looks back at that time fondly. I do know the entire album was almost finished and then pretty much completely scrapped and then started over. But again, the whole process was less than a month. Everything got dumped and resurrected in less than two weeks. We're talking about 10 or 12 songs. That is a quote from Carl Koch about the production of Weezer's eighth studio album, Hurley. Wanna know more? Well, uh, you kinda can't. Strap in, because this one's gonna be a bumpy ride as we try to answer the oddly complicated question, what the fuck is going on with Hurley? Mwahahaha! <laughs> Happy Hurleyween, everyone! Please send help. I don't want to draw too much focus away from Hurley here, but this isn't actually my bedroom. I've been captured by a shadowy government agency for talking about Hurley, and I fear for my life. Luckily, I was able to trick them into thinking I was making a propaganda video about vampires. The outfit was non-negotiable. Me? Talk about Weezer? Never. Except those times. Hurley is a special case, though. It came at a strange time in the band's career. By this point, they were nearly 15 years away from their seminal work in the 90s, and their output had been straying further and further with each project. This all sort of culminated in the release of the previous year's Ratitude, an album I'm frankly sick of recapping on this channel. It was bad and people didn't like it. Weezer and their From and Rivers Cuomo were well aware of this, so they pitched Hurley as the one to bring them back to their roots. Did it? Not exactly. It wasn't received that great critically, fans don't hold it in high regard generally, and commercially, it was Weezer's worst showing ever for a studio album until their next one. But what if I told you it was the best album ever? Well, I wouldn't, because it isn't. What distinguishes Hurley isn't anything subjective, rather the objective truth that we don't know shit about it. This is most evident when trying to research the album's background. Interview-wise, 2010 was almost bone dry. This shouldn't matter, though, as we Weezer fans are usually spoiled by the band's dedicated online encyclopedia, Weezerpedia. The website is a credible, reliable source of information about the band that has made my weird ambitions way easier. Yet, our knowledge of Hurley is so limited that the artwork and name section of its entry is almost longer than the rest of the page combined. I said almost. And look at the information that comprises the rest of the page. The album was pressed on black vinyl, as well as translucent green and bright red vinyl. Some copies of the album on vinyl come with a CD copy as well. Wow. Crazy. Again, I'm not trying to diss Weezerpedia. Hurley was an extraordinary circumstance. Trust me, that's the last time you're ever going to hear Hurley and Extraordinary in the same sentence. Remember that quote from the top of the video? I mentioned it came from Carl Koch, which is a name you may not recognize even if you're a big fan of the band. The easiest way I can describe him is as Weezer's fifth Beatle, their webmaster, historian, archivist. He's been there from the beginning, and he's been documenting everything along the way. Much of Weezerpedia relies on his first-hand knowledge. The man is a veritable fountain of Weezer lore, and he was absent during the entire production of Hurley. I wasn't at any sessions for Hurley. It's the one album that I wasn't present for any of it. So all I heard was accounts like that. So one of our main sources of Weezer knowledge wasn't there. And the information he does seem to have on the subject is pretty vague. He mostly gives minor details, like some of the band members not knowing the songs before they are performed in studio, that really just hammer in the point that the album was rushed without much elaboration. He did mention, though, that he learned about the initial draft of the album from someone who was there the band's manager. This reminded me that countless people work on these albums, so if I can track down just one of them and ask them about Hurley's production myself, I can answer questions literally no Weezer fan has found before. But for that, I'd need a list of credits. So, I bought a Hurley CD. Let me tell you, it was not easy getting this delivered to the shadowy government prison I'm being kept in. Fun fact though, while I was searching for this on eBay, I stumbled upon a lot of 10 of them for $30. I mean, honestly, come on, who would actually buy them? Insult to injury, I found the credits online. This is now my least favorite purchase. Still, with a reliable list of names, I reached out to anyone I could and waited patiently for a response. So, in the meantime, let's talk about the album itself. Hurley is another in a long string of Weezer compromise albums, where the band's frontman is forced to balance his own ambitions with the restrictive desires of fans and critics. He's taken many different approaches to this in his career, but Hurley is 
the most um, Hurley Pardon my hesitance, there was a minor carbon monoxide leak. Reading several reviews of the album back to back is a lot like flipping through a thesaurus. You hear a lot of different words make the same point. Scripted, corporate, predictable, mechanical, basic, manufactured, disappointing, Weezer by numbers. I really like that last one. Overall, they seem to like Hurley's personal themes on change and legacy while feeling it struggles to execute them. There is a pretty clear consensus that the album shines with memories ruling me unspoken and time flies, with critics differing on train wrecks and hang on, and basically agreeing on the album stinkers. Mostly where's my sex. Basically, while not repulsive, the album largely fails to impress. Yet, what caught me off guard was the number of flat-out good reviews, many of which credit Hurley as a flawed return to form. Though, this may have less to do with Hurley itself, and more its predecessors, as another term is often repeated in the positive reviews. The group's strongest album in recent years. The one exception comes in the form of Hurley's kindest review, an incredible A- from Entertainment Weekly, who I guess were so embarrassed in hindsight that they deleted it just a few years later. Luckily, the internet archive exists, and oh boy, I don't blame them for deleting this. The reviewer claims Weezer was dropped by Geffen when every other source says they chose to leave after their contract ended, gives no love to memories while saying the album truly starts with train wrecks, an ode to a messy relationship which is not what it's about, claims Unspoken is about Rivers trying to prove himself as a man when it's actually about his distaste for his early marriage, lauds over the consistently maligned smart girls as a geeky California girls that wins the award for most likely to get stuck in your head, and is the one review I Read that doesn't mention where's my sex, not positively or negatively. I get that this isn't Time Magazine, but holy shit, who's the editor? Bizarro? <laughs> Don't misconstrue me here, my gripe with EW isn't in the fact that they liked Hurley, more in how they justify it and to what degree. That's basically what any discussion of the album boils down to, really. Most people agree on the broad strokes, but differ on the finer details, which ultimately, in my opinion, is what has caused Hurley's lackluster legacy. Attention is only reserved for the very best, the very worst, or the ones no one can agree on. Simply, if an album drops in the woods and no one has a hot take on it, does it make a sound? Thankfully, Hurley does have one distinguishing feature, the previously mentioned ambiguity behind its production. A big part of music criticism is understanding the intent of the artist, and unlike other albums, we really don't know what Weezer was aiming at here. Beyond many critics' claims that Rivers had hyped Hurley up as Pinkerton 2, which I've found no evidence of in interviews, all we know is that it was made in a rush. Whether that was a deliberate act of laziness or an unfortunate accident would be hugely helpful in coming to a definitive conclusion on the album. So, once again, a big sticking point of this video is reliant on uncovering Hurley's behind-the-scenes secrets. Thankfully, I messaged quite a few people on that very subject. Let's check the inbox. Yeah, it's empty. So, I was originally going to list all the people that I messaged, but I'm a little worried I might accidentally unleash the horde on them, so I'll keep it vague. All in all, I reached out to 11 people through LinkedIn and email. Basically, anyone in the credits of Hurley besides the band members or Carl Koch who could have some first-hand knowledge of the album's production. At first, I actually wasn't getting any responses. Then, I started sending messages where I didn't mention Hurley, and I got two responses. Then I mentioned Hurley in my follow-up message. It's a bit suspicious, but before we start shouting conspiracy, I should mention that I may have been hoisted by my own petard. Or, in layman terms, I probably fucked it with my dumb brain. For example, I reached out to one of the album's mixers, and he responded. But in an attempt to grease his wheels in my second message, I asked him a specific question about one of the songs he mixed. Except he didn't mix it. However, I only made that mistake once, and I was very professional in my other messages. I got my mom to check those. So, uh, you smell that? CONSPIRACY! There's actually multiple conspiracies tied to Hurley, so we'll start with the one you nerds might know. Hurley Gates. Mostly Nixon free. This is just a catchy name for the theory that Hurley, the album, was bankrolled by Hurley, the clothing brand, and like any good conspiracy, Hurley Gate is based on facts. This was Weezer's first time releasing an album under the indie label Epitaph, meaning they didn't have the funding they did with the much larger Geffen Records. The album coincidentally also released early in PacSun stores, and Weezer launched a merch line with Hurley around the time of the album's release. Even more coincidentally, one of the studios where the album was recorded was Hurley Studios, owned by, you guessed it, 
Hurley. Then, in an interview with Exclaim, the band's guitarist Brian Bell stated the name for the album came from a surf shop called Hurley that was funding the record at the beginning of the recording process. So, okay, actually, now that I say it all at once, it is pretty damning. But we must give Weezer the benefit of the doubt. I may be a lying snake bitch, as some have pointed out, but I don't like hearsay or lawsuits. To me, the theory falls apart when it claims the cover photo of Jorge Garcia, who played the character of Hurley on Lost, was chosen as a cover-up for this partnership. So, if anyone asked why the album was called Hurley, they could just say, cause of the photo of Hurley. And pardon my French, but that's just fooey. Weezer is a silly, dumb band. They don't need an elaborate conspiracy to choose a random photo as their cover art. They literally did that with their last album, and their first album. Much less do they need to justify using a photo of a celebrity friend of theirs. Weezer loves their celebrity friends, Michael Sarah and the entire cast of Jackass cameo on this same album. It's honestly more believable that they chose this photo for no reason than any reason. Plus, that quote from Brian Bell was taken out of context. Context. Here's what he said later in that interview. I don't even know how they're tied in so much, although we got some clothes and we did a photo shoot where we're wearing these clothes and I think we're selling these clothes in malls. So how that's tied in, I don't know. Clearly, he wasn't very informed on the subject. He later released a retraction saying Hurley had no financial involvement and Carl Koch basically gave the same story 10 years later. If there is any conspiracy going on here, it's likely tied to the fact that I am being held in a secret government prison for talking about Hurley. I mean, one of the studios where the album was recorded was the Pentagon. <laughs> Without more input from people who actually worked on the project and with the conspiracy theories being less than credible, the question of Hurley's behind the scenes chaos comes down to a couple educated guesses. An easy but boring answer stems from the same facts that spawned Hurleygate. Epitaph is an indie label, Weezer was bankrolling an album themselves for the first time, this could have caused a myriad of issues, ranging from funding to time management to lack of resources. Maybe Weezer just wasn't cut out for it, which would explain their switch to Republic Records in the following years, owned by Universal. But if that doesn't satisfy you, there's always another fact that Hurleygate stems from, the real partnership with PacSun and Hurley. If brand partnerships for big acts like Weezer are anything like sponsorships for YouTube channels, then maybe there was a strict deadline. Maybe Weezer's contract with PacSun specifically stipulated they get the album on the 10th of September, and if it was any later, they'd be open to a lawsuit. Or maybe there was some ambition behind Hurley. Rivers is a bit of a perfectionist, and it wouldn't be the first time he scrapped the track list. Maybe he just wasn't happy with the initial direction of the album, so he tore it apart and took it in a new one with the little time they had left. Maybe it was a mix of all three. Weezer had to bankroll the album themselves, so they did a small brand deal with PacSun and Hurley, which came with a deadline. But because of some last minute crisis of creative confidence, Cuomo had to scrap the project and quickly patch together a new one. I don't know. I may never know. Because nobody answered my questions. Likely because nobody cares about Hurley. It's a shame that an album with such heavy themes of legacy came out so dull to many that its own legacy has withered. Still, at the end of the day, it's a fine album. I like it, if I didn't mention that earlier. To me, it's the Weezer equivalent of a Phase 2 Marvel movie that comes on FX while you're staying at a hotel, and it's not your favorite, but it's raining outside and the beach is closed, so why not? It gets the job done. If you really love or really hate Hurley, please let me know. It saddens me to think of this long list of credits, all people that put all this effort into the album just for it to be forgotten. That's terrible. Nothing deserves to be forgotten. Please, talk about this album. If we normalize discussion of Hurley, they might release me from prison. Please. Please! Hello? I'm still recording in here. I'm, I'm not finished yet. Hello. If you liked the video, like the video. If you liked me, subscribe. I have more videos, so you should watch those videos. Thank you. This is a very new format for me, but I had a lot of fun, so let me know if you liked it. If you made it to this point in the video, comment free mark, because I am still in jail. It wasn't a bit. I'm slowly starving to death and eating Hurley CDs. Okay, thanks, bye.